Xin chào tất cả các quý vị, xin cảm ơn các quý vị đã đến với chúng tôi ngày hôm nay. Chúng ta sẽ thảo luận về cách thức chúng ta sẽ suy nghĩ lại cách thức. We know that a billion people today suffer from malnutrition. 80% of those are in the agricultural sector. So it's probably the single most important issue that faces the world today. And at the same time, it's probably the single most neglected issue um, at forums like this. So it's very good to see the World Economic Forum paying so much attention to uh, food production and, uh, and uh, organizing a special world food program. It's a big change, and I think it's about time that happened. Well, today you can see uh, we've got a panel of um, experts who can guide us some way towards first stating the problem, what exactly is it. Then we plan to do, go into what are possible solutions like innovation, technology, trade, etc. And then we plan to end with what are certain goals that sh we should aim at, big goals, two or three big goals that sh we should aim at. Now, the format of the uh, next one hour will be at each stage when we take up a topic, after we've talked about that for a few minutes, then I will ask for questions from the floor on that particular topic. So it won't be, all the questions won't be at the end, but about half this entire uh, program will be devoted to questions from the floor, short crisp questions, please. But let's get a first introductory remarks of what the problem is that we are facing. And we'll start with uh, the Prime Minister of Tanzania. Thank you. Well, in India, you use Prime Minister. In Tanzania, you use President. President, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> in India, the Prime Minister's <laughs> Everything. The no, president of Mr. Kikwati. Well, of course, it's, uh, it's a daunting challenge to be given the task of defining the problem. But what I can say to start with is that, indeed, there is a huge challenge of feeding the world today. A billion people are undernourished, and we have 6.1 or 6.3 people, billion people now. And by 2050, there will be 9.2 billion. So indeed, it's a big challenge. But to begin with, I can say that we can feed ourselves. At the present levels of population and by 2050. Why do I say so? Because one, there is plenty of land for agriculture. Two, despite the odds, but the, the climatic conditions are permissive. Moreover, there is plenty of water. There is sizable water resources for agriculture at the present. And third, technology and skills are available. So on the basis of this, I believe we can feed the population now and in future. What needs to be done is to overcome the constraints that keep productivity, production and productivity low. Once we succeed to overcome that problem, we are home and dry. So the key problem is productivity and yields. And production, yes. Now, we'll, if we can ask the Prime Minister of Vietnam, not the President, the Prime Minister of Vietnam to speak. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to discuss on the topic Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to discuss on the topic of how how we can secure food security for the world today 
in a more rapid way, in a more sustainable way, with the three conditions. First of all, to secure the availability. Second, to ensure the stability in supplying. Thirdly, is to ensure the ability to gain access to food of the people. So I will then discuss on these few topics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Xin cảm ơn ông. If I could ask now Patricia Wirtz, who's uh, co-chair of the World Economic Forum and also uh, chairman, president, and chief CEO of ADM. Thank you, uh, Roy. It's um, from my perspective as a, uh, a global leader in agriculture, as well as the CEO of ADM, that um, we see the growing demand that the president described as, as a key issue longer term. So it's not only that the population will grow by 50% by the middle of the century, but that the demand for agricultural products will double because as people become more prosperous, they eat a better diet, there's demands for agriculture. I am similarly optimistic that agriculture can fulfill those needs. Um, and, and in the short term, I think agriculture has a key role to play in the economic recovery. Because as, as many know, agriculture, and of course we don't eat agriculture, we eat food, but agriculture contributes to the reduction of poverty twice as much, some people think even as four times as much, as investment in other sectors. So agriculture with its effects across, up, down the chain has the ability to alleviate poverty. So in defining the problem, I think it is not only the longer term of feeding a growing population, and providing for that, those needs, that growing demand for agricultural products, but in the short term, uh, the need for economic recovery, investment in agriculture, in infrastructure, in technology, uh, will help provide some of the, uh, the, the solutions to that immediate problem as well. Uh, Bill Gates? Well, in, with food security, we have the short term issue uh, which is the billion people. And back in 2007, we saw as uh, middle class diets are demanding more food, as was said, that the prices spiked up and uh, we had terrible availability problems. And some of the responses to that even made it worse. Uh, the long run problem is that popula population increase times the food intensity. And to achieve that is going to require a lot of innovation, uh, even just spreading the way things are done today across the world, that alone won't do it. You have to have new, uh, high productive seeds. You'll have to avoid a lot of pathogens that are uh, going to come along and, and go after these crops. So only by being very optimistic about the innovation piece and funding it both for the world as a whole and a lot of specific donor funding for the developing countries, that, that's the only way we'll, we'll meet this challenge. Right. And, uh the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is donating a lot and working together with the World Economic Forum, the World Food Program. In fact, I'll, I'll do a little anecdote. I was interviewing uh, Bill Gates some time ago and I said, could you do a sound check at the beginning, say one, two, three, four? And he said, one billion, two billion, three billion. <laughs> and I think he can say that's the amount he's donating now for the World Food Program. That's just great. Thank you. Ellen Coleman. Hi, I'm Ellen Coleman. I'm the uh, chair and CEO of the DuPont Company. And to add to Bill's comments, technology is certainly going to be a key element of filling that gap in doubling uh, the production of food between now and the year 2050. But technology alone is not going to be enough. It has to come with education and collaboration. Um, we can, uh, the industry can produce great yielding seeds and technologies to protect it from insects and and, and other issues. Um, but until we can figure out how to educate the farmers so that they're using the right combination in, the right, in, in their weather conditions, until we can get collaborations, research alliances, collaborations on market access so the farmers can get their goods to market in a real grassroots way, because ha it has to occur farmer by farmer. And I think the three of them, innovation, education, and collaboration, and Bill would add funding, 
um, I, th I think are the major elements of really bridging that gap. <laughs> Great. Mm -hmm. And the one and only Ngozi from the World Bank. Thank you. I don't know about one and only. There are many Ngozis <laughs> from my country, but thank you. Um, I, I think that rethinking uh, feeding the world, um, you know, we need to think of three or four challenges. Uh, even if we're able to produce, we have to think of one, the fact that there are other sources of demand for food products that are competing with food now. We see that a quarter of the U.S. food maize production goes for ethanol. Other countries are using food, uh, palm oil and so on, for fuel. So, um, you know, it means we have to think perhaps bigger because you have these sources of competition. You also have to think of things of, like the impact of climate change on food production, the volatility and variability of uh, food prices going forward and what this will mean. I think you th the, 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 as, as the world changes um, and as incomes grow, we also have a shift in terms of the demand for food. People are demanding higher value food products, even in developing countries, and you have to think how do we work with small farmers to meet that kind of, of, of demand. And then we have to think of the dynamics of rural urban uh, uh, movements that are happening and how we manage that as more people migrate to the urban areas. So these are some of the challenges in rethinking how to feed the world. We must focus on these as well if we are to succeed. Right, so we can see we've got a huge problem ahead. And um, to look at some solutions, let's start with the basic issue which everybody's talked about, and that is the problem of yields, that we've got to increase, increase productivity. Uh, what kind of innovations? We've already seen one green revolution, and some countries haven't gone through that yet. So th there can be an intercept change, the countries that haven't been through a green revolution to go through that now. But those that have already been through it, what are the other innovations we need now? Like, should I say the word, genetically modified food? Is it a good thing, bad thing? Um, Bill Gates, innovations that we need to have another big jump in productivity and yields? Well, Africa's the main place where the uh, benefits of the Green Revolution haven't been felt yet. And uh, it's partly that they have a variety of crops. It's partly the variety of weather conditions. It's partly this issue of, of getting the education and inputs, including fertilizer in. Uh, uh, you know, those are big challenges. And so there has been uh, a new group, uh, the African Green Revolution uh, organization, headed by Kofi Annan, that's uh, gathering up money, uh, bringing together expertise, uh, and working with the dealers, working with the uh, seed uh, uh, makers uh, to get those, those things out there. So there's some hope that we can get Africa up quite a bit. In, in the meantime, we have to invent things that go even beyond, and you know, it, it comes down to yield. Uh, the yields are going to have to be a, a dramatically higher than they are today across a, a huge number of crops. So are you for or against genetically modified food? Well, what, what our foundation is doing is we're working with uh, partners. For example, uh, DuPont Pioneer on some new maize things, uh, with ADM on some cocoa growing things. Uh, some of these are traditional breeding and some of them are transgenic. In parallel, we're also funding scientific expertise in Africa. So when, three or four years from now, uh, if things uh, go as, as expected, there are some crops with big benefits, drought resistance, that tra the transgenic approach uh, uh, probably Absolutely. can do better than any other approach. Each country can decide what are the benefits to them and what are the risks, what's known about right. safety, IP licensing, and things that would make them hesitant. Right. And then you know, they'll, uh, on their own, be able to make that decision. The likelihood that the safety profile will be okay and then that will be beneficial, I hope uh, that works out because it is a tool, uh, particularly for disease resistance, where you can put in a, a new gene called an RNA interference gene for a particular uh, uh, crop problem, it would, it would be a, a real help. And, you're right on the verge of starvation all the time, so every tool that's safe and appropriate, you at least want to look into. Ellen Kuhlman, uh, DuPont 
does produce gen genetically modified food, as well as many other things, high-yielding varieties. Uh, are you facing a lot of resistance through a little knowledge is a dangerous thing kind of approach? Or are, are, are you confident that GM is the future? Well, I, you know, I think that if you're going to resolve problems like drought resistant, you're going to have to use genetic modification to get there. You know, I can't think of a product in terms of genetically modified seed that has been more tested and uh, more thoroughly vetted in many of the countries that currently allow it to grow. Uh, I think in 2008, uh, we surpassed 2 billion acres globally um, where biotech crops are grown. And so there is a lot of data out there, there's a lot of information, and there's a lot of benefits to it, but I think Bill's right. Each country, That's if they set a science-based, transparent, regulatory um, framework, um, then the industry can work with those countries in order to, to bridge that gap and the productivity that is needed to fill that food gap. So in Vietnam, uh, what is your approach to increasing productivity and yields with genetically modified food? Actually, there's genetically modified food and genetically modified other crops like BT cotton, etc. Uh, before, ladies and gentlemen, before discussing this uh, very specific uh, question, I'd like to touch uh, on the an overview on how to ensure food, global food security. Ladies and gentlemen, food security is uh, not merely an economic or, or humanitarian issue, but also plays a key role in keeping political and social stability of each country and the entire world. Uh, uh, it is now time for us to work out new measures or ways to ensure food security across the globe in the faster and more sustainable manner. With that, I would like to share with you my thoughts on the following points. First, it's important to guarantee three major factors, including the availability, sustainability, and um, accessibility. It is essential that each country. I to ask you, in Vietnam, you've been very successful in increasing productivity. Um, in Vietnam, you've been very successful in increasing productivity. How did you do that uh, without using any sort of uh, genetically modified foods? Uh, I think that uh, to ensure food security, as I said. First, we need to ensure, uh, enhance productivity to ensure uh, availability and to have a good distribution channels. To, to, and then we must ensure the accessibility of the people to the food resources. And each country must make its own efforts with international, combined with international uh, assistance. With that, we could ensure food security for the community. Uh, second, productivity and uh, to increase the uh, output, science and technology is very important to help us um, enhance productivity and output. So you, you're not against genetically modified food yet. I don't know why I'm carrying on uh, just, just to get your... We do not uh, oppose the uh, application of uh, GM food, but in Vietnam it is not yet necessary for us because per hectare of rice we have a productivity of 10 to 15 tons per hectare. So we have 4 million hectares of agricultural land, we could provide sufficient. Right? So we do not yet need um, GM food, and we are still self-sufficient in production. Can I just ask the audience here, uh, the three approaches to genetically modified food, those who are against it totally, those who are in favor, and those who say, if I, as long as I know it, I don't mind, I'll take the choice. Can I just have a raise of hands? How many people here are against gen genetically modified foods? 
<laughs> That's only about 5%. Do you see so how many of you are in favor who would actually eat genetically modified foods? That's about 40%, 40 and 5, 45. And those who say, I'd like to at least know, have full information, that's the other 45%. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, now, Pat Patricia, there are other things besides genetically modified foods, different ways of increasing productivity and yields, which we see as the big problem. Uh, what would they be? Well, maybe I'll, I'll comment um, on that with sharing that there has been a community here at Davos that spent some time in the last seven months uh, working on what we call uh, the future vision of agriculture. And part of that discussion this morning, we had a very lively discussion that included uh, President and, uh, and Gosi. Uh, um, some clear takeaways from that, I think, was that increasing productivity is very necessary, but not sufficient. Um, we also talked about investment in the entire value chain or the entire agricultural chain, particularly infrastructure, transportation, uh, storage, um, getting even the basics of roads and trucks and getting crops to market or getting them to the people that need to, uh, um, to eat them. So the idea of uh, not just productivity but things beyond increasing yields such as even reducing post-harvest waste, which is something we could take on today. Um, as we've heard in several sessions, the crops that are grown and are, are uh, wasted or are um, left to spoil because there's not an investment in infrastructure or because they don't have an ability to get to market is as much as 20% in some areas. I know in your country you talked about that. So investment to actually make more efficient use of the crops we have today, as well as not to waste what is grown, I think is an important part of, again, closing that gap between right, what is needed. I think needed. that's a very important point, post-harvest wastage, that you, we have pictures, visuals in India of children suffering from malnutrition, and we have these 50 million tons of food stock, far more than we really need for security, with rats eating 10 million every year. So you have malnutrition and fat rats. Uh, they don't quite, it's a bit of a stark picture. Well, I mean, maybe <laughs> one more point, too. The investment in innovation related to product, production of agriculture, production of crops, is about 95%. Only 5% is going to this post-harvest innovation ideas. So, again, more work to be done there. Um, we're working with the University of uh, California at Davis, who has an institution associated with this. So, uh, again, more, more emphasis in that area. Right. Uh, President Kikweti, uh, how is Tanzania looking at increasing yields uh, at, at this stage? Which stage of the agricultural cycle are you right now? Uh, we have a host of, a host of, of interventions, of course, because um, one of the things that we are looking at is changing the technology. Uh, predominantly, our agriculture is technology is the, is the hand hole. 65% of it is the hand haul. So we're now trying to see how to mechanize, mechanize agriculture. Uh, because, as I said, this but it's typical of Africa. Mm. Only 10% of Africa's agriculture is, 10% uh, is, is by tractors. Uh, in Thailand, Thailand has more tractors than, than the whole of sub-Saharan Africa put together. So. Right. One of the things we're doing is really how, how to mechanize agriculture, that's one. The, the, the second thing that we are, we, are, we, are, we are engaged with in Tanzania and almost the whole of Africa is increase the proportion of irrigated agriculture. Right now it's only 4% of our agriculture in Africa is, is irrigated in, um, in, 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 in Asia is 20%. So we, we, we need to get there. This is another challenge. The other is the, the use of high-yelling seeds. We, we, have, we, have, we, have, we are not talking about the GMOs, actually getting to the seeds that in Vietnam they use and, and get 15 tons per hectare. We're using the traditional seeds, which yield very little. So here is it's really a question of investing in, in agricultural research, which, 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 which we, are, we are now doing. And then besides that is building capacities for, 
for seed multiplication so that as, mo as, 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 as many farmers as possible could they get high yielding seeds. So the use of saying, fertilizers. So you're saying mechanization, irrigation, irrigation. and better high, seeds, high, high, hybrid seeds. And then fertilizers. And fertilizers, yeah. The now average for Tanzania is nine kilos per hectare. At least in South Africa, it's 50 kilos. I'm told that in the Netherlands, it's more than 500 kil it's kilos, so per hectare. So the, the, these and, uh, and other combinations, the lack of herbicides and pesticides, the challenge of post-harvest losses. So it's, it's, it's a set of combination. And looking at uh, the crop marketing systems, we, which again discourage farmers. If farmers s produce crops, the markets are, are not assured. The prices... Are, 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 are again not favorable. So for us to increase productivity is, is again a combination of ir mechanization, irrigation, high yielding seeds, getting the fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides, right. organizing. But again, the biggest challenge we have is imparting skills to farmers. Right. So how do you get the, the, the extension officers? It's a question of training the, 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 the agricultural officers, livestock officers, to impart skills and knowledge to, to the farmers. So the, the, it's, it's a combination. And then, of course, look at infrastructure, rural infrastructure, to get the, the, the inputs but a lot of to the countries, farmers. A lot of countries have been through this, so you have a path you can follow. And Gozi, now we've talked about yield increasing. We've talked about food stocks being wasted around the world. Before I go to the audience, another big issue, another uh, solution which we need to, another problem we need to solve besides these two? Uh, well, there's one problem I want to talk about in terms of production, yeah. um, and that is addressing the right, the people who really produce. Studies that we've done at the World Bank find that often women are not the ones. Women uh, uh, do the bulk of the production. We must put that on the table, but very often the extension advice and the targeting of new uh, ideas don't go to them. And it's shown that right. if you make sure that, that those who are actually working and growing the crops are the ones who are receiving all this, you can get up to 20% more yield in some cases by working with them. So um, fact, we, we, we have to put that on the table. Women must be at the center of this, at least as far as the African countries are concerned. Most studies show the highest return is investment in uh, human capital of women. Yeah. But in addition to that, I don't think we should get fixated on the production alone. I want to come back to something that was said in terms of distribution, right. what we talked about this morning. You can find in the same country that there's enough food, but you can't get it from one part of the country to another. So we, we must, you know, most of the time we talk of increasing output, but many times you find farmers who are produced but they can't, we, the country can't get it from one part of the right. country. And then worldwide, sometimes it's not the fact that there's a shortage, but trade barriers and protectionism and, and, and you know, just a feeling of insecurity about feeding your own population. Also stop one country from sending food. Look at what happened during the food crisis. We found that food markets were very thin. Yeah. You just couldn't get food. Some countries had surplus grain. Ukraine had five million tons of surplus wheat. And right. in the end, it was able to send some out to the market and prices began to come down. So we must look at those other right. factors as well. Right. Can we have a question from the audience? Uh, there's one at the back on the left there and one here to get the mics there, please. One here. Could you introduce yourself and a quick question, sir? Thank you very much. Andrew Maynard, Director of the Risk Science Center at the University of Michigan. We hear a lot of talk about challenges requiring solutions and a lot of talk about innovations. What we don't hear so much about, though, is how to get from point A to point B. So the question is, how do you get those innovations out of the hands of innovators to the people in the field that really need to use them? Bill Gates, would you like to answer that? Yeah, let me give an example where the pieces came together. Um, there's a lot of these uh, institutes, uh, the CJIR uh, institutes, that do basic crop research. And uh, the Green Revolution work largely uh, came out of uh, the fact that they got funding and they worked with the in-country organizations. Uh, recently, one of those called ERI, it's based in the Philippines, it's the rice uh, organization, uh, had found a gene that if the rice was flooded, 
would allow the rice to stay there and when the flood would go away, it would keep growing. Whereas normally if you get flooded, the rice just dies. And they were able to take this gene and put it into the different varieties uh, very rapidly. And now the poorest rice farmers, who are the rain-fed non-irrigation rice farmers, are getting huge benefits from that. Uh, it's, it's a, it used, not transgenic, but it used the latest technology, that is the sequencing, in order to understand that they were taking just this one characteristic from this one rice that could withstand submergence and putting it into these very high-yielding varieties that people liked. And so you were just getting the good uh, coming from that. So it's, it's a great model for how, whether it's disease resistance or drought resistance or salt tolerance, almost a dozen things we need to go after, uh, how you can move quickly, get it into the research, get it through the national organizations, and promote it to the farmers, which is this extension service government excellence. Uh, this one, uh, India did a, a great job, and it's actually... Uh, now being done in Africa as well. I think it's very important that these examples are, the success examples are, 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 everybody gets to know them and they're disseminated well. There's a question here on the left. Yes, sir. A large uh, percentage, perhaps a majority, of the world's farmers don't have secure legal rights to the land that they farm. And without that, don't have the appro appropriate incentives and can also access credit easily. This is especially true for women farmers. What role does getting land rights right have in feeding the world? Anybody particularly want to take that? Mm. But there, yeah. there are people that, that we funded a couple organizations uh, that are completely focused on, on that issue. And there's some reasonable progress being made on it. It varies country by, by country. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Tanzania and Vietnam, do you, is that an issue or not for you? In what? Vietnam, sir, is it an issue to that uh, land rights, uh, that people don't have rights to their <coughs> land and therefore they're insecure and they don't, can't invest as much as they would otherwise and produce as much? In Vietnam, uh, everyone, every, citizen, every farmer, in, uh, every farmer in Vietnam, Producers uh, on their own land, they have the right to use the land that is a driving force to develop agricultural production. So it's not a major issue. Yes. Well, what we have First, it, it is true that if people don't have land rights, it becomes impossible for them to get, to get bank loans. <clears throat> So we, what we've been trying to do in the country is to make it easy for people to get land rights. When you use the normal, the, the normal system of the, of the land surveys, uh, it's very expensive to take the, the surveyors to the farms. So what we've been trying to do, of course, this, this is through the, the, the model that uh, Hernando de Soto has developed. Uh, we... We have, we, we have been in, in the villages. First, we have, we, in the villages, we create what we call the land, land registry. So we have now been training people in the villages, those who have gone past primary school or secondary school, how to use the GPS. So somebody would come to my farm. He, he, he stands at this corner. He, he, he writes the coordinates, gets to the next corner, the other one and the other one. So through, through this process, you, you can do, we, we are doing mapping. And it is done by the villagers themselves. And then through that, then they coordinate, they, 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 they have a, a complete map of, of the allocation. The other thing that we have done now, the, the, the villages have been empowered to issue land certificates. And these certificates issued by the villages are recognized by, 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 by the government. They are, they are, they are, the register is then transferred to the, to the national. Are you computerizing a lot of this? Yeah? Is a lot of it being computerized? Yeah, now, now we have started the state, they, 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 we are now moving on the stage of computerization. Right. So that at the village level, when they computerize, of course, it's a question of building the capacities. For, okay. a, for a poor country like ours, it becomes difficult. But it's one of the areas that we've given its priority. We have nine, 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 south village, nine southern villages. We have now almost done about 3,000. So we are doing this. And it has already begun to pay dividends because in some of the villages, 
in, in some of the districts where peasants have their, have their land certificates, they use it to, to, to get loans from, from right. banks. Right. I remember of, of a district I visited, I think, three months ago to issue these certificates. And then I was told already the farmers there have accessed about $5 million in, in, in bank loans for, for the agricultural activities. Right. So this, this is, it has, to, to us, it has helped to, to do it much easier at, at the village level. Right. Patricia, if I can ask you a, a problem. Okay, we move on to prices. That's the second big issue, which uh, we find that uh, farmers really are, uh, don't get rewarding prices. It's not a very profitable area to be in, so there's less investment. One of the factors we see in developing countries is that the urban, poor, urban middle class is so vocal and so politically strong that food prices are kept low to keep them happy. And uh, the farmers lose out. Of course, in India, having, uh, since we have elections so often and since 65% of the voters live in farms, uh, they do have to consider those votes as well. But the other issue is what the West is doing on prices. These huge subsidies uh, in Europe and in America to farmers are keeping world prices down, which means developing countries, farmers can't get a decent price for their uh, produce. And if, if those subsidies were removed, prices went up, farmers got a good uh, return to their investment, uh, wouldn't that help productivity? Prices, how do, we, how do we ensure farmers get better prices? Well, one thing that I think someone said earlier is that when it comes to food productivity and supporting one's rural communities and economies associated with food production, countries tend to look inward. Right. Um, that sometimes flies in the face of world trade issues yes, and yes. one who believes in global trade. Right. Uh, doesn't mean you always find open trade, even though you may believe in it. So uh, one thing about pricing, though, that may help in this perspective is that even when you see high prices, the correction for high prices is generally the high price because it drives more supply. What right, we exactly. saw with the recent high prices, uh, and maybe the answer is that we're in a period of volatility which will be with us forever, so that means high and low, highs and dips, but high prices drove farmers in the most productive regions of the world to plant more. So supply is increasing, and one thing about agriculture is it renews itself every harvest, every cycle. Do you think the West should stop subsidizing their farmers? I think there will be continued discussion with <laughs> open trade. <laughs> I, I mean, think believe there in will open be, trade and everything else, but this is... I, I still believe in it. I, <laughs> I, I believe in it. I believe that countries, though, will continue to... And Gozi, Patricia just raised the issue of volatility. It's not just prices, it's the risk of farming. Risk of weather, risk of prices, both out of the control of the farmer. How do you, how do you combat that double problem of, high, of low prices and high risk? in farming? Well, I, I think um, um, that we, we have to be thinking of agriculture differently. You know, Bill Gates said we should think innovation, innovation. And I think I agree, innovation is not only in the area of production, but also innovation is in the area of financial instruments that could be used to help farmers and countries manage volatility. And I think we need to, th to think about that. I mean, uh, we've been working at the World Bank with Swiss reinsurance, and we did a small uh, scheme in Malawi, you know, um, to help them manage uh, the risk of drought and, and, and floods and so on, whereby, you know, if, they, if there's an occurrence, you know, they can get some payment back, which they can then use to help the farmers. We must think of those kinds of instruments, even in Haiti today so with the catastrophe. Some kind yeah. of insurance so insurance-based in, products that right. can be used to help farmers and, in, and, and yeah. must in be Vietnam, part of the Vietnam, how do you uh, compensate farmers for this high risk of a bad monsoon or a bad harvest in a particular year or a drought? The riskiness of farming. Uh, in Vietnam, we uh, the farmers are given the land, uh, the certificate of land, and they can use that certificate of land to secure bank loans. 
And when we suffer from losses, such as the loss in the crops, they will then be get the subsidy from the government, assistance from the government. Now here I would like to mention that uh, to increase the yield of the food in this world, one very important issue is that we need the community, international community, to be committed to eliminate the, the maximum, the tariff barriers, especially developed countries, needs to eliminate with no conditions the huge subsidies for domestic agriculture. And only then can we encourage countries to produce agriculture and to enhance agricultural productivity. And I will call on developing countries, developed countries, importing and exporting countries to show their good wills to put aside differences so that they work together to finalize the Doha round within this year. And as we finalize the Doha round, that is a very good condition for us to promote the agricultural yield in the world. Ellen Kuhlman, this is a Dubai request Ellen from Kuhlman. the Prime Minister saying that, you know, can you stop your subsidies and open up trade in agricultural products? Do you see that happening? In, can there be a target five years, ten years, something the West, particularly America, huge subsidies? Now, these issues have been with us for quite a while, and I fear that there is no easy answer, mm. that it's going to take a while to work it out. And that's where I go back to productivity and technology. Because I think part of the issue is, is getting more equalization in terms of output around the world in certain crops. We have a huge disparity now. If you look at maize, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, an, an acre produces 17% of what an acre in the United States produces. And when you have that kind of disparity, you get those protectionist tendencies. And so I think working on equalizing that is one of the areas that can really help in terms of stabilizing um, from the standpoint of countries turning inward and, and looking to protect themselves. Right. Bill Gates, looking from this end of the telescope, you know, we look at the West with these huge subsidies. It's like the West saying, okay, we're giving huge subsidies, we're messing up the system, we're ruining the markets, we're reducing prices. Now we messed up the system. Give us some other solution on how to solve agriculture. But we're not going to, we're not going to undo this mess. Well, for the West, the, the subsidies of the West... There's some of that, that that distorts prices and reduces developing country op opportunities. Mostly it's just a waste of money. Uh, right, right. <laughs> and if some small percentage of that went to donor aid to help bootstrap the investments uh, that the farmers need to make, uh, that would pay off in terms of nutrition and uh, livelihoods and, and getting rid of starvation. One group that we've reached out to is, is the private sector. And I think almost all the companies involved in food in any way uh, at the World Economic Forum, we have some type of uh, partnership with. Uh, with ADM, we're working with cocoa farmers because what they were, they were making couldn't be put onto the international market. The quality, the storage wasn't right. Um, uh, we're working on coffee, uh, which Africa can, can make very good coffee, but it's not sorted in the right way. Rice, Ni Nigeria imports rice even though it sh should be growing its own, own rice. Uh, with Coca-Cola, we have a fruit uh, effort where it's in uh, Kenya and Tanzania to take uh, passion fruit, mango fruit, and get them to store it and do it in the right way where they can access the market. So getting them further up the value chain and making sure that the price that gets down to them is a much higher percentage, uh, there's going to have to be some funding, but the returns on on this funding is really quite phenomenal. Right. Any questions on pricing? Uh, gentleman at the back there, on, on pricing. If you could. Well, to the extent that uh, in the short term, the likelihood of withdrawal of subsidies uh, is uh, not something which we, on which we can expect uh, very quick answers. And considering the fact that the present uh, present spurt in prices of food grains is going to remain for a while, what other steps can be considered to get countries out of an autarkic mindset which has set in in terms of self-reliance, which can allow for the global forces to equilibrate the present spike in global prices which we see? Ngozi? 
Would you, uh, Bill Gates, you wanted to answer that? Yeah. Well, one of, uh, one of the big fu food buyers in the world is the World Food Program, and they do a great job. Donors have often forced them to take the food from the rich countries instead of donating money and allowing uh, the crops in nearby African countries to be purchased and increasing the capacity there and having lower transport costs. There's been some progress in reforming uh, this so that countries give, give more money. And there's been some effort to, we've given a lot of money to World Food Program, so they're working with the local farmers so they can qualify for those, those purchase programs. So Africa needs to open up trade within Africa. There's still quite a few <laughs> barriers, whether it's policies or infrastructure, that uh, prevent that from working well. I think in addition to, to all that, we, we have to look beyond aid. Um, I, I don't think that you know, aid can solve these problems alone. We have to really encourage investment. Okay, so if the private sector, if we can't get the subsidies down and uh, it's going to take time to, as the Prime Minister of Vietnam pleaded, to complete the Doha round, get the tariffs down, get the subsidies out at least the private sector could come to those countries when they create the right environment to invest. And when you invest, you can have, many countries have enough space and room that you can have both commercial agriculture and smallholder agriculture side by side. In fact, they can work in such a way that they benefit. The smallholder farmers can benefit from a private sector farm that sets up and serves as you know, an outgrower develops uh, outgrower schemes that can then provide, you know, sort of a, a market and a distribution channel for the small farmers. It can work, you know. So, it, so all I say is we need that investment. Um, you know, so enough talk already. Uh, those who want to help, come and invest. Right. <laughs> Hi, uh, Don Lam from Vietnam. Just uh, a question. With all the increase in production, efficiency, and all this innovation, but I don't see by 220, uh, sorry, 2050, we have enough food. Do you see there's more conflict in other countries if there's not enough? If there's no major leaf in food production, will there create conflicts? You know, there's technologies today um, that we and others in industry are working on that, for instance, can um, increase the yield in soy 40% over the next uh, 8 to 10 years. And that's just what we know today. And there's research programs that continue um, in, in many of these areas, and not only on um, just the, the general yield, but the conditions in which they operate, being able to grow in drought conditions, being able to use less nitrogen, um, and to really create some efficiency. So what we know today can get us at least half the way there. And I think that the investments that the industry is making um, will continue to, to produce results. Um, the question then is, the first one that came, how do you get it to the market? Because, you know, as, as we go into countries in Africa and we're working on a local basis, you can create real progress, but how do you leverage that across a larger area faster? You know, we've been working in West Africa with Africa Harvest, um, West African Seed Association. Uh, we've worked to create four local seed companies. They're locally owned. And they've trained right now close to 2,000 farmers. But how do you take that, that's one small right. area, and leverage it? That's, that's kind of the issue that we're coming up right. against. How do you get up that curve very quickly? Right. Patricia, uh, Bill Gates also talked about this going up the value chain. Uh, apart from normal tariffs, there are other barriers like standards. What kind of standards do you use in producing your food? Uh, now we're seeing a lot of private standards. You have a Walmart standard, you'll have a Tesco standard, you'll have somebody. So it kind of prevents economies of scale. If you have a lot of private parties setting their own standards, is it time for a, a more of a global body that sets basic <laughs> standards at least? And if you cross that, you can export. Well, um, perhaps a, a quick description. You know, ADM as a company is neither a retailer, a, a retail right. food manufacturer, nor a producer, we kind of work in that, that space between taking the global harvest to, to the food producers. And frankly, the not only standards by particular retailers, which you comment on, but even standards by countries. We talked earlier about GMO. To have to segregate or the need to segregate crops and different um, 
aspects to get them to market because of the differences across countries or right, regions right. is probably the first process to solve. So some unification um, on standards is needed, right? But then you think through the consumer side, probably right. that's where you want choice. You yeah. want some differences. You want people to have the opportunity to choose different types of foods, Yeah, food because products, a lot of the innovation in standards have come from the private sector, so. They have, yes. Yeah, so can you have a global basic standard and then innovate privately above that? Uh, it, it or something, seem because at the moment it's chaos. Well, I don't, I wouldn't go with uh, K. I would say there's a lot more problems that we've been talking about solving before the standards, the standards of that. But, you know, for an exporter, it's a big issue because they say, oh, well, you didn't meet this particular standard. We can't import your food. So the gentleman there. Jeff Cape from Canada. The opening question seemed to be how will we feed the population? Uh, the entire focus has been on production. It seems to me what we've missed in the conversation has been the issue of obesity and the fact that there are more people obese in the world today than they are malnutritioned. So if you combine the fact that we make, we produce enough food globally right now to feed the world, <laughs> if we deal with our waste problems and we deal with the issue, uh, issue of obesity, we may right. solve the problem very quickly. Right. <laughs> Eat the right kind of food. <laughs> it's just not food, it's nutrition. That's the point. <laughs> Gentlemen, oh, there is, yeah, right there. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Steve Schneider, I'm a climate scientist from Stanford University, so how could I not ask a climate question which has to do with price? One of the things that we expect as climate changes, since we can't predict the details, only the general trends, is there could be a further increase in volatility, not just year to year, but also in the distribution of where it's produced, from especially north to south, with the south being more disadvantaged. One way that you can ensure against that volatility is through food reserves. We learned that a long time ago. I wrote a book in 1976 called The Genesis Strategy. Remember Joseph in Egypt saved the grain. It was violently opposed by the Midwest because they thought that grain reserves were going to drive down prices, yet it also provides a measure of security. So the question I have then is, how do you want to deal with the trade-off between production incentives and having a safe set of storage, and who should have the storage, and what should the rules be for its release? Good question. Anybody like that? Everybody seems to be thinking about it. While they think about it, would, would you like to take that on, Gozi? Would you like I'm to? I'm just trying to, to think, mm. you know, of how um, you could think of uh, various ways of, of uh, dealing with this, but we actually have an expert on this issue in this audience, and I think we should call on him to answer his... Well, Kim Von Brown is sitting right there. He's done a lot of work thinking about the issue of grain reserves, so um, he, he, instead of quoting him, let him speak for himself. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Ngozi. Um, remember the situation in 2008? Um, production problems uh, uh, led to nervousness in markets. Prices uh, increased. Um, speculation set in. Borders were closed. Um, markets failed. Uh, countries tried to build their own stocks country by country. That's very inefficient. So what we have been arguing uh, for is a, a system of shared global reserves combined with a virtual reserve, so not uh, a pile of grain but a pot of money, uh, which uh, can be mobilized uh, through well appropriately uh, regulated uh, commodity exchanges to engage in um, preventing price spikes, not general stabilization schemes. We had those in the past. Price spike prevention schemes, which prevent the spikes which have uh, killed people. What about if there's a drought? You could draw on that, those reserves as well? Uh, if the drought is large and uh, international or regional prices go through the roof, yes, of course. Okay. Let's get to the final stage. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I can each ask each one of the panelists to talk about goals that should be set. This morning, uh, Ngozi, we talked about setting some big goals. Uh, like I think uh, one that was suggested was there should be no child with malnutrition by 2025, or some particular year. 
Is that a feasible or any other big goals that each one of you could set as an agenda? Actually, I wasn't the one that, uh, it was Josette Sharon, yeah, the correct. head of the World you Food picked Program, it up, yeah, right. who, who said, and, and I picked up on it and said, right. maybe if we set ourselves some big goals and then we can work towards that. And I, and I, agree, I agree with that. I, so I think give us one goal that we should have. Well, that's a good one. You this know, is one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Why not? <laughs> you Coleman? know, by 2020, we shouldn't have any child who is uh, hungry or malnourished. Right. And then we can go from the obese uh, children and obese people, you know, to those who, do, who are skinny and don't, oh, well, they may be <laughs> skinny healthy, but those who don't have enough to eat. That means we have to solve these problems of distribution of food, not just production. Right. Now, if you have a goal, then a whole lot of things fall into place. Fall to into try place. Yeah. So that's a good one. Okay. None that's of our one. children should be hungry. Ellen Coleman? No, I think that you have to break it down. So I would suggest a goal, you know, in let's talk sub-Saharan Africa, of why not double the production um, double in sub-Saharan Africa through productivity and do it in a reasonable amount of time, in 10 years. 10 years. Okay. Bill Gates, a goal that you'd like to see? Yeah, I think one way to look at this is from the point of view of the smallholder farmer. The majority of the uh, truly impoverished are smallholder farmers. And so if you have a goal of doubling their income uh, so that they uh, have enough to feed themselves, enough to, to sell some, uh, to make some money, and therefore break the cycle where they can't afford the fertilizer so they don't buy the fertilizer so they don't get the yield so they, they don't have the money out in the future. Uh, there's a real bootstrap that has to take place there. And, you know, I'm a, a tiny bit of a broken record on this. The, this is very effective aid, helping these smallholders uh, get out of this. So it's got to start as aid, and so I'd say doubling those incomes should be a goal. Doubling the incomes of small farmers in the next 10 years or 15 years. Exactly. Excellent. President? <clears throat> well, well that, that's... that's uh, l let me say that... Um, let the world have a goal of, um, of looking at Africa as the place or the continent that can feed the world. Right now, as I said, land is there, climate is conducive, water is, is available, so what, what, what is required is make technology available, make financial resources available to farmers in Africa so that they can increase their productivity in the production. They'll be able to feed themselves and they'll be able to feed the world. If at the moment a farmer in Africa produces for two people, food to feed two people, while the farmer in Europe produces to feed 130 people, just imagine if you can also augment that, that capacity in Africa, also to be able to feed the 130 people. Greatest potential. This world, this world will have no problem of hunger and malnutrition. The greatest potential for change. The potential is still there. That's why I'm saying I'm confident. Right. Right. We can feed ourselves now and in the many years in the future. Patricia? Well, I'm also optimistic, and um, I believe that the bigger goals are, are the great ones, but breaking it down to uh, kind of build on a, on a point, and since we've talked about productivity, we've talked about the smallholder farmer, um, I'd like to see a doubling of investment in agricultural infrastructure, and not just in the developing countries, but also the developed ones, which we've sometimes ignored, even in the United States and Europe, continue to need investment in infrastructure. And on the other side, I'd like to see a halving or a cut in half of the amount of post-agricultural waste. So if the average is 10 20%. to 20 percent, we should be able to take that down by half. So bring down post-harvest waste from 20 percent to 10 percent. That will release a huge amount of food. And increase. And double the investment. In agri in you had two goals for infrastructure. the price of one. So, mm. I believe that the decrease in the loss in post-harvest by half in the next 10 years is very feasible. 
in Vietnam 20 years earlier, the post-harvest damage is 20 percent. Now the post-harvest damage is only 10 percent. So that means it's totally feasible. I would like to repeat that to ensure enough food for the world, there are many solutions that many of you have offered, but I would like to emphasize that only when we can elim eliminate trade barriers, eliminate protectionism, eliminate subsidies, uh, no conditions, only then can we ensure food for the world. Thank you. So, so eliminate subsidies in the next 10 years. Mm. Right. I think that's a wonderful. I think the panel deserves a round of applause. Thank you all very much. And thank you very much indeed. Some you know, have hundred thousand children. Right?